than the arena of athletics. The people that have, or teams that have displayed a level of expertise, a level of dominance, have established a history and a reputation of victory after victory after victory. Uh, from the individual professional tennis player to the Olympic wrestler, to the team sport of basketball or football. Such surprising displays have come in time. Uh, for example, what about the 2004 Olympics? Once the United States made a decision to let the professional basketball players in the NBA compete in the Olympics, previously only allowing amateur athletes from college to compete, once they let professional players to compete, they began a string of dominance, Olympics after Olympics after Olympics, bringing, hold, bringing home rather the, the, the sort of expected gold medal. And then 2004 came. The roster, if you will, was stacked with names like LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, Tim Duncan, and Allen Iverson. It seems like the result is a foregone conclusion. It'll be another gold medal, medal Olympics. And yet, they lost. They lost. Some of you, because of your country of birth, will be quite happy to know the story. If you don't already know it already from Argentina, they lost. 89 to 81. This was no buzzer beater. This was no bad call of a ref. They lost. Convincingly, they were beaten. Went home with their tail between their legs, embarrassed, ashamed. Well, how about what happened in 2008, four years later, not in basketball, but now in football, when the New York Giants were going up against the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl? Sorry to bring this up, Tiago. At that time, it seemed like a foregone conclusion. I mean, the New England Patriots had a dominant year. They had gone the entire season, if you will, 16-0 and in regular season. Kind of skirting through the playoff for another three victories. They were going to be the first team in NFL history to end with a 19-0 and record. And they're up against a wild card team. They didn't really kind of make it by playoff schedule. They kind of made it because, well, it's that playoff opportunity, that you know, performance type opportunity you give to somebody to make them feel better, only to be losing in the first round. Well, at least we made it to the playoffs. This year with the New York Giants. And even in the very game itself in the Super Bowl in 2008, the New England Patriots are leading even up into the fourth quarter. But surprisingly, at the very end, Eli Manning, the quarterback for the New York Giants, has a stunning comeback drive. And the drive's key play, you can still watch it on high reels today, is this moment where the ball is passed. Uh, it's, it's, it's hiked to Manning, and he starts to scramble, and he's ducking and weaving, and he's missing one tackle after another. And he throws the ball to none other than David Tyree, who catches the ball in the air up against his helmet and literally lands on the ground with the ball against his helmet. And it shocked the world. That didn't win the game, but that set him up for what would come later, 35 seconds to the end of the game, where New England Giants would score and win the Super Bowl, destroying the dream, the Patriots. Tiago, we have tissue available for you. <laughs> Guaranteed wins that actually end up in stunning losses. It's one thing when the losses are pride and sports records. It's another thing when the losses are about lives, literally having died. How do you process that then? Well, today we come to Joshua chapter 7 and 8. And in these two chapters in the book of Joshua, what you think would be an easy win a simple victory. After all, Jericho proved to be a light snack. You basically have a worship service for seven days, shout, and then claim your victory as the walls come crashing down. 
And yet what looks to be an easy victory ends up in a shocking defeat. To kind of summarize where we're going to be this morning in these two chapters, much to be said, all of which I'm excited to share with you, but here's sort of the main point. Sin has consequences that are more serious than often realized. Sin has consequences that are more serious than often realized and should be dealt with to restore your relationship to the Lord. On the screen, that is the main point for where we're going to be throughout this time. But that sort of gets unpacked in these two chapters together in three lessons. Lesson number one, your sin affects others. Let's go to Joshua 7. We won't be able to read all of the both chapters in their entirety for the sake of time, but we'll be capturing it in its essence in different parts of it. Joshua chapter 7, verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Kamri, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. So there in verse 1 is this great transition. If you look back to verse 27, it says, So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. And then you come into Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, and it's literally like an about face. Now, what happens in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, is that the writer is basically giving us From our perspective, looking back thousands of years later, what is not yet known at that time by Joshua, the people of Israel. It's like a a spoiler alert, if you will. He's sort of telling them the problem and how it happened. And then he goes on to sort of describe it. Well, look what happens. Verse 2. So this is before then. After Jericho, Joshua sent from men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. They returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So, verse 4, about 3,000 men went up from there from the people. And they fled before the, man, the men of Ai. Not the sentence you'd expect to read there. Verse 5, And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men, and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And what's interesting in that text is that last phrase there in that verse, their hearts melted like water. That, that's a phrase that we've seen earlier in Joshua that has been put on the people, the Canaanites, not the Israelites. They fear God. They fear the people of God and their hearts are melted. The king's hearts melt. The people melt. They're fearing this. And yet here is sort of a turn of events. The people that you would expect to be the victors, the winners are now the losers. The people you think would be confident and triumphant, their now hearts have melted like water. They're overwhelmingly discouraged. You can see what happens here. This setback is a profound one. So what happens? Well, now comes the prayer. Verse 6, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? to give us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us. Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Oh Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? What you see here in the text can be interpreted, albeit wrongly, as Joshua becoming fearful and doubtful. You can maybe be tempted to read that in the text based on the tone you might associate, like, 
Oh God, as if we should have never have come. We should have gone back and never have crossed over. Almost like you can hear in Deuteronomy, or rather Exodus chapter 16, where after they have this great worship service, they then doubt God. But that's not what's happening here in the text. Joshua genuinely is asking the Lord, and I want you to see what's going on. Sort of make our way to kind of get to the clarity of what's happening here. Why the cause of all of this? Well, we're told. It says in verse 10, the Lord answers. The Lord said to Joshua, and it kind of gives a five-fold aspect to what's happened. Number one, Israel has sinned. Number two, they have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. Number three, they have taken some of the devoted things. Number four, they have stolen and, you know, put them among their own belongings. And then as it pairs that up, they've lied. What you want to understand here is that God is not leaving Joshua ignorant as to why this took place. He's letting them know why this took place. And what's significant is to recognize that the sin of some, Achan and his family that we're about to see, affects the sin of the whole, of the people of Israel. You can see this as it says this, kind of this continued representation. It says in verse 10, Israel has, they have, they have, they have put them among their own belongings. And yet, when he gets into like, okay, how was this taking place? Who actually specifically did this? He explains a process he wants him to go through and look at what should be done. What I want you to recognize that should not be missed is while we're going to get to the specific reality of Achan himself, God holds the people of Israel responsible collectively. Now, this is a bit perhaps jarring or maybe even seen as unfair for some of you. The sense of like, well, I didn't do it. Why should I be held responsible? This is like a sibling who's, you know, got his siblings, his sisters or brothers. They've been misbehaving as kids, or at least some of them. And the parents say, you know what? No TV tonight. You know what? We're not going to, we're going to go to bed early tonight. And the kid's like, wait a minute. I picked up my room. Wait a minute. I cleaned the bathroom. Wait a minute. I took out the trash. And you can feel like as a, as a, like a young child, that's not fair. I didn't do something wrong. But the parents making a decision for all of the children to be affected by that they might all learn a lesson based on the action or inaction of one. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of what we later see in the New Testament. Profoundly painful issue has come up in a brand new church called the Corinthian church. And Paul is addressing them about the fact that they have a man in their church who is having sex with his stepmother. They know it. Paul knows it. No one's addressing it. And he makes the statement in 1 Corinthians 5 that a little leaven leavens the lump. You're like, since when are we starting to bake for Jesus? He uses a phrase that he would also repeat again to the church in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 5. He's basically saying, listen, this problem here, this infection here, if it's not addressed, it will spread. Because people are going to learn how seriously they're to take their profession of faith and following the Lord based on watching other people who profess to follow the Lord. And that will spread to the rest of the assembly. So the problem is not simply the action of one, it's also the inaction of the others to not address the one. The mistake made today by many Christians is to think that their sin only affects them and they are making a calculated decision as to what the cost of the sin is. This is incredibly short-sighted and self-centered. Let's go back to Achan, the man to whom we're about to meet. When he made that decision in the conquest of Jericho, was he thinking calculated logically at a linear level? You know what? Here we go. I'm about to take some gold, some silver, some, 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 you know, some swag of this merchandise from Babylon that I really want to have for myself. And I know later on it's going to cost 36 people their lives. It's going to cost our entire people group a loss at this village. It's only got about 12,000 people in it. My gold is worth this many people's suffering. I doubt it. I doubt it. He simply acted in the moment what he wanted for himself. And his family complicit in that and that they went along with it. But isn't that kind of how you and I think today about sin? 
What you do in the privacy of your bedroom when no one is around, I mean, that's, that's kind of between you and the Lord. What, what you do at work, what you do with a few friends last night, what, what you did this past, I mean, we're not there. We're not having Chris Jude lead us in singing. We're not having, you know, Michael pray over us. We're not having Garrett read the scripture to us. We're not all there. So, you know, that, that's kind of your space. But is it? Joshua 7 says no. 1 Corinthians 5 says no. But often that's how we think by default. Notice what happens here. What happens is the consequence of what's to come. God tells him, verse 13, get up, consecrate the people, and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. It's a shocking reality to kind of see the consequence. If you can think of chapter 7, pinnacles what's happening, sort of pointing towards verse 12, what was just stated before then. The people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before the enemies because they will have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Now, notice the contrast. Go back to chapter 6, verse 27. Verse 27 says, So the Lord was with Joshua. Chapter 7, verse 12, I will be with you no more. This is a statement of present relationship and current blessing because of the disobedience of the people. Now, what I want you to see, back to my comment of observation of Joshua's concern, his concern is not for the pragmatic rally. Wow, we lost some people. We want to do that again. Wow, that's embarrassing. We're going we're to have a bad PR campaign. That's how it, prayer looks like it leans. But notice how Joshua ends in verse 9. He starts off saying, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and will cut off our name from the earth. And then he says, and what will you do for your great name? Joshua's concern is for the glory of the Lord. His concern is not ultimately and finally about the consequences of sin. His concern is about the reputation of God upon his people and how his people will be a bad reflection of him. God, what are you going to do for your glory? Now, just think about that by consideration. Here's a question for reflection. What would concern you more with sin in your life? The negative consequences that come from it or the loss of relationship with the Lord? What would concern you more with sin in your life? The negative consequences that come from it, or the loss of relationship with the Lord? I imagine if you're like me, you're tempted to think, I'm concerned about the negative consequences. I'm concerned about sort of the cause and effect, the reap and the sow. I, I want to kind of avoid the landmines of maybe embarrassment, of maybe issues, of maybe poverty, of maybe criminal actions, of maybe reputation. But that's not ultimately where we need to be driving towards our motives and our decisions. For Joshua, it's the glory of the Lord. I mean, just practically speaking, audit your prayers. Do you have a category for regular repentance? Regular repentance. I'm sure you're probably like me, you have a category for regular requests. Got them back. Uh, I've got a few more things I want to talk to you about. This is happening, if you could address that. Saw this person, if you could address that. I'm thinking this, if you could answer that. I'm wanting this, could you direct that? But do you have a regular rhythm of repentance? Is your ultimate request in your prayer what the Lord Jesus was teaching in the, in the disciples' prayer, also known as the Lord's prayer, Lord, glorify yourself in me. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life. This takes us to the second lesson in Joshua. The first lesson is your sin affects others. Secondly, repentance is shown in more than words. 
Repentance is shown in more than words. What's kind of shocking about God's response to Joshua's prayer, verses six through nine, is what the Lord says in response. Look at verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Again, verse 13, get up. (laughs) He's basically saying, hey, stop praying and go do something about it. Now, he's not faulting Joshua for praying like that was the bad play. He's just saying it's more than simple you having a conversation with God about the problem. It's what you're going to do once God shows you what the problem is. And this is an important distinction because I think for you and I, we need to have categories of distinction between confession and repentance. Confession is to say the same thing God says about sin breaking God's law, disobeying his will, not walking in the light of his word. God, I agree with you. That, that is wrong. I own that. I'm not arguing about that. I own that. That's called confession. But that's not the same thing as repentance. Repentance is that and the desire and the action to turn from that. Once you know what it is, once you've learned what it is, once another's helped you identify what it is, you're like, okay, I don't want to do that again. Which is why Paul says so clearly, for example, in first, in Ephesians chapter four, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called. What you see here that God intends Joshua is for him to take action. Verse 10 again, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Deal with the sin. Again, verse 13, get up, consecrate the people. Tell the people, consecrate yourselves. You've got to deal with the issue at hand. And you can see what he does here in verses 13 to 15. He kind of tells him to cure. The Lord tells Joshua how to identify the sinner and how to address it. And then there's a radical process in verses 16 to 23, how God gives Joshua specific instructions for determining who is the guilty person. You can see this in verses 16 and 17, how the Lord points out the tribe to which the guilty person belongs. And he points out the clan within the tribe and then the family and then finally the person himself. And it's It's Achan. Look at verse 19. Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. Tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Verse 20, and Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. God wants Joshua to identify the problem with the person and address it in an undeniably clear way, which is what happens for the rest of chapter seven. Bringing out the family, stoning, burning, burying under a pile of rocks. I mean, just by reflection, have you ever wondered as a Christian if God has not turned his back on so many churches because they have turned their back on his clear teaching in the Bible from Jesus about church discipline. I mean, Jesus says himself in Matthew 18, you see your brother in sin, sins against you, go and have a conversation with him. If you've won him, rejoice, you've won your brother back. If he does not listen to you, take two or three witnesses that they might understand this is not some personality debate. This is a biblical concern raised and confirmed by others objectively, confirmingly. If they don't listen to you, you should then tell it to the church, the the people who've covenanted together to identify as brothers and sisters in that community. Not to gossip or slander, but to say, guys, help us, bring this as a concern. And if they don't listen to the church, it says, you shall treat them like a Gentile and a tax collector. Meaning you should say, we have no reason to believe that they are continuing to identify with Christ because their profession contradicts their practice, or their practice rather contradicts their, their profession. 
And how many times have I been in a foundations class at Grace Church and I've asked people, how many of you, if you're a part of a church before, a lot of you have come to this church, you've never been a part of a church before. How many of you have ever been a part of a church where you saw and heard and practiced church discipline? How few hands actually go up? In fact, I think it sounds actually quite judgmental and unloving and kind of like non-Jesus-y. You're like, well, you know Jesus actually taught this. 1 Corinthians 5 shows us. 2 Corinthians 1 addresses us. This is a normal way of how we are in community. Imagine having such clear instruction here and yet not dressing it. Now look at what Achan does. Look at what he steals. A beautiful robe from, it says Shinar, which is basically Babylon. It's perhaps acquired by someone in Jericho who traded it with a Babylonian. So he takes it from when he was in the battle at Jericho. 200 shekels of silver is about five pounds of silver. And then 50 shekels of a wedge of gold is basically about a pound and a quarter of gold. It's not small, but it's not overwhelming. But listen to this. It's not what's found under Achan's tent that's a concern. It's what's found in Achan's heart. The heart gave birth to that action that brought that treasure, if you will, which didn't become treasure, and put it under his tent. Achan wants what men have, and he does not trust in the goodness of the Lord that God will provide. I mean, track the line of thinking here with me. Achan may well have reason. After all, Achan could be thinking, I've been deprived of the good things of life these many years in the wilderness. Here is a beautiful new and stylish garment and some silver and gold. How could God want to withhold these things from me? After all, they'll never be missed. The people to whom they originally belonged to aren't even around anymore. They're dead. And I'm entitled to some pleasure and prosperity. I've worked hard for the Lord. I've trusted the Lord. I, I did like everybody else. I submitted to the circumcision expectation. I crossed the Jordan River. I did the battle. I didn't question. And, and now I've been a good soldier and I now deserve this. And my family deserves this. Joshua, back in chapter 6, verse 19, had told the people that all the silver and the gold were to be put into the Lord's treasury. What is Achan implicitly doing by taking this? He is rationalizing away God's word with his own compromises. He's doing the same thing you and I are tempted to do today. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. If you knew the day I had, if you knew the husband I was married to, if you know the child that I had, if you knew about my coworker, if you understood how hard I have worked, if you understand, there's always a means to justify what the heart wants. Here's a question. How are you tempted to justify your sin? What decisions are you making right now that you know are wrong, but you have found a way to justify them? I will think differently when they act differently. I will act differently when my consequences change. I will speak differently when my circumstances change. I put conditions upon my obedience and my condition are upon the decisions and actions of others. Until then, I feel entitled to do what I'm doing. Though I know objectively before the Lord, it violates what His Word clearly tells me to do. Justifications and conditions. Here's what eventually happens. We will eventually sin when we are convinced of what we deserve, then content with what God has provided. We will eventually sin when we are convinced of what we deserve, then content with what God has provided. Achan is essentially saying, I deserve this. God's not provided it, so I will sin to get it. Or I will sin if I don't get it, which, by the way, is how you identify idolatry in our hearts today. You sin to get it, or you sin if you don't get it. So just in case we want to throw Achan on the bus and go, what were you thinking? Uh, hold on, I think we can really identify with Achan. Now, a sneak peek as we now go into chapter 8, but let me just show you a crazy connection. Jump ahead to chapter 8. It's basically the battle AI, take 2. To get a running start here, look at verse 1 of Joshua 8. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, do not be dismayed. Take all the frightened 
the fighting men with you and arise and go up to Ai and see I have given in your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land, and you shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king. And here's the kicker. This will get you this verse right here. Only its spoil and its livestock you shall take as plunder for yourselves. Friends, if only Achan had waited. the Lord would have given him more than he could have ever imagined. He settled for a little silver, a little gold, and a garment. And in the next battle, the Lord is going to tell all the people of Israel, everything you see, you can have. How tragic this is. Dale Ralph Davis writes, God never seeks to impoverish his people. It is only as his people lose sight of his generosity, his provision, his goodness, that the cancer of covetousness. And so what ends up happening? Well, what ends up happening in the rest of chapter seven is after it's been identified, it has to be addressed. It says in chapter 7, verse 25, And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned him with fire and stoned him with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remain to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of the place is called the Valley of Achor, meaning trouble. It's kind of a play off of Achan's name. Two issues to address here. The action has taken the severity of the action. Here's what I want you to recognize. The more serious the condition, the more serious the action is to address the condition. I imagine there's a number of you, if not most of you, think when you read this, that seems a bit severe. That seems a little over the top. If you think that way, as understandable as it is, that it's still wrong in its assessing. If someone is diagnosed with cancer, you don't prescribe to them more vitamin C. You say, you have a disease that's so significant, if we don't remove it by surgical uh, removal, if we don't kill it by radiation, if we don't try to overwhelm it with chemotherapy, you will die. We don't just give vitamins. The more serious the condition, the more serious the solution, the action needs to be taken. And that's exactly what we deal with when we deal with sin. God addresses it, which takes us to our third lesson, God does forgive and renew his relationship to you. So the first lesson, your sin affects others. Second lesson, repentance is shown in more than words. And then the third lesson is that God does forgive and renew his relationship to you. What ends up happening in chapter 8, as I read to you already, verses 1 to 2, is they do as the Lord commanded. They essentially have not only confessed the sin, repented of it, addressed the problem, And then the encouragement comes. And so here's what ends up happening in verses 3 through verse 29. The Lord tells Joshua to set up an ambush, stage an attack, pretend to retreat, signal these other men an ambush, and capture the city. And that's exactly what takes place. And he tells them specifically in verse 18 of chapter 8, stretch out the javelin that's in your hand towards Ai, and I will, for I will give it into your hand. Verse 26, Joshua did not draw back his hand with which he stretched out the javelin until he had devoted all the inhabitants of Ai to destruction. And then after that, verses 30 to 35, let me read to you. At that time, Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, the Mount, on Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the people of Israel. As it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones upon which no man has wielded an iron tool. And they offered on it burnt offerings to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And there in the presence of the people of Israel, he wrote on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written. And all Israel, sojourner as well as native born, with their elders and officers and their judges, stood on opposite sides of the ark of the, before the Levitical priests who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, half of them in front of Mount Gerizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded at the first. 
to bless the people of Israel. And afterward, he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that's in written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them. What's significant to recognize is that what's being cited here is exactly what Moses said to do back in Deuteronomy 27. In Deuteronomy chapter 27, verses 4 to 6, Moses literally tells them to do this exact thing. That's exactly what they did after they crossed the Jordan River after this battle. The question is, why did they do this? They did this essentially in a way that sometimes a married couple, after being married for many, many years, will perform in almost ceremonial fashion like their first wedding day, the renewing of their vows. Have they divorced? No. But do they want to remind themselves the relationship they have to one another? Absolutely. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They are, as a people, renewing themselves to the Lord, not presuming on just the victory, okay, we're good, but remind themselves it's only according to how we walk in the Word. Now, for a rich connection, let me show you something. Look at Joshua 6, talking about verse Rahab. Look at verse 25. I love the sound of this page is turning. Joshua 6, verse 25. But Rahab, the prostitute, and her father's household, and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive, and, referring to Rahab, she has lived in Israel to this day. Now, jump ahead, if you would, to Joshua chapter 7. Referring to Achan and the family, verse 26. They raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Now, jump ahead to chapter 8, verse 29. And they hanged the king of Ai on a tree until evening, and at sunset Joshua commanded, and they took his body down from the tree and threw it at the entrance of the gate of the city and raised over it a great heap of stones, which stands there to this day. Now, why do I emphasize that? Because I want you to see there's an important theological connection here that should encourage everybody in this room. What you see is that God is not a genocidal maniac. This conquest is not about ethnicity. The Lord is going to exercise his judgment against all sinners who rebel against him and do not turn to the Lord in faith. Whether or not they're the king of Ai or they're Achan. It does not matter your ethnicity. It does not matter your family. It matters whether or not you, individually, personally, have made a decision of whether or not you will turn to the Lord by faith in the only means by which you could be forgiven of your sins. Not on the altar with rocks, not in some ceremonial proceeding, but through only through faith in Jesus Christ, His Son. And what you see here in the text is something beautiful and glorious. The Canaanites failed to believe the Lord and they were judged. You're like, well, that doesn't seem fair. They seem like they had an ethnic disadvantage, but they knew the entire time, and Rahab even said this herself. And Achan and his family failed to do what the Lord called them to do, and they ended up buried under the stones. This repeating emphasis of under the stones to this day, under the stones to this day. But then the Israelites who trust the Lord and correspondingly walk in his ways will be saved just like Rahab. So friends, it does not matter whether you grew up in the church. It does not matter whether you come from a Christian family. It does not matter what ethnicity or economic education background you have. It does not matter what you have done or where you have been. It matters whether or not you yourself before the Lord will say, my faith is in Christ, the Son of God, my Savior. And because of Him, I don't have to fear judgment. Because of his righteousness and my faith in him, I know I am forgiven. And I, out of honoring him, want to live in obedience to his word. 
Friends, for some of you this morning, that's where you've got to begin in this conversation. Do you have the lack of faith of Achan or the faith of Rahab? For others of you, you've got faith, but you've also got treasure underneath your tent. You've got sin that you know of, and here's the kicker, the Lord knows of. I don't know of it. The people seated around you don't know of it. Your spouse probably doesn't know of it. Your children don't know of it. Your parents don't know of it. Here's the kicker. The Lord knows it. And is that enough for you to realize you need to deal with it today?